Rich will never draw attention to himself, but he wrote that last one. If you didn't notice that at the bottom, um, it's a real blessing. Deal with it. Too bad. <laughs> continue to uh, talk about just our plans, you know, who, who truly is Lord over our life, over our plans, where we're going, and what does it look like, what does the Bible say about that, and I just felt like I wanted to preface with something that God, I believe, put on my heart, and I'm going to be suggesting today multiple questions we can ask ourselves to try and get a sense of where we're really at. And if we really want to walk with God, if we want our lives to glorify God, if we want to live His plans, we have to begin with being honest with ourselves. We can't... Um, We can't settle for just Christian platitudes. We can't settle for just kind of letting ourselves off the hook. Well, I do church, I do Bible study, whatever. You know, of course, He's Lord of my life. It's there's things that we have to ask ourselves. But there's there's two two ways to see that though, and this is what I want to clarify before I go on. The devil would have us use those answers for condemnation and shame. You know, okay, we, we, we look at this, we go, wow, you know, really, God doesn't have a lot of my life. You know, a lot of it is me, not him, a lot of whatever. So the devil comes right in behind that, you know, and he's sitting there going, yeah, you're just a failure. Yeah, you've been a Christian for this long. You're just a fake. You're just whatever. And shame and hopelessness. And yeah, you've tried all over. How many times have you tried to change it all up, you know, and... And you sing those songs, and you're a fake, and you're, you know, like, and, and that's the devil, okay? God says there is no condemnation in Christ. He says that has been nailed to the cross. And nothing can separate you from the love of God for you that is found in your faith in Christ Jesus. God says, okay, now you've seen something about yourself. Here's my invitation. Here's my invitation to move ahead because I am the God that makes all things new. I am the God that, see, you can't, if you don't recognize it, to begin, you can't address it. You need to know what's going on, and then you can start to move forward. And it's, it's painful sometimes. It's hard. It takes humility. It takes a willingness to not self-justify or sugarcoat. And, you know, as I say, it kind of sounds funny the first time you hear it, but you got to want to be right more than you want to be right. And what I mean by that is you got to want to be right with God and walking the right path more than you want to self-justify and explain move yourself away to see, feel like you're right. It's, but when that becomes your desire, though it hurts and though it's painful, God says, all right, now let's move on. Now, now we're at a place I can work with. Until you stop sugarcoating and self-justifying and you're just honest about where you're at, I can't really work with that because it's a, fa a false foundation. But when we're honest, you know, it was one of the songs Rich was leading, and I think it was, the words were something like, you're all that I desire. You know, you're all I need. And I sang it, and then I just added quickly, please Lord, make that true of me. I want that to be true. I, there's more that I want. There's more I desire. There's things that I really I know get in the way of fully serving you, God, that I want for my own comfort, my own desires, my own, you know, and I don't want that. I want to be able to truly say, you are all that I need, Lord. But right now, you know, I know if this happened or this, there'd be more that I, you know, and I don't want to be that way. You know, I don't want to be the God that after the rain comes, quits worrying about my well. I want to be the God that doesn't worry about my wealth before the rain has come. 
you know, or whatever, you substitute whatever that is in there for you. You know, and but to do that I have to be honest with myself. I have to recognize where I'm at. And so that is my heart in these questions. It's not just to beat us up. We should walk out the door going, man, I guess I'm just a failure in every checkbox available. We should walk out the door going, wow. I learned something about God today, and I learned something about myself today. I didn't necessarily like what I learned about myself, but God has got his hand there, and he says, son, daughter, let's go. I'm the one that turns ashes into dancing, and mourning into dancing, and sorrow into joy. I am the God that has plans for your life. I am the God that says all things are made new in me. I am the God in whom nothing is impossible. I am the God that promises you there is no temptation in your life too great that I have not given you a way out through me. Let's go. Let's start. Let's move on. You know, I, I think of Elijah. I love the, I just love that story of him. And, you know, he, he does this, gathers 800 prophets and priests or whatever of Ashtoreth and Baal on the Mount Carmel. And he's like, okay, Israel. You guys have walked long enough trying to straddle the fence between two gods and all that. It's time to decide who you're going to worship. And he says, put two altars, you know. And he says, all right, call you guys, put your cow on the altar and call down to your God. Call up to your God and have him send down fire and torch it. Consume your offering. They spend all day. And they get more and more frantic, and they start cutting on themselves, and blood's flowing, and all this. And he, Elijah just starts taunting them. Maybe you want to call out, or maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's going to the bathroom. You know, yeah, it's in there. It's in the Bible. <laughs> you know, maybe. And they're just finally, it's enough's enough. It's getting time for the late sacrifice, and he's like, "All right, my turn. <laughs> Dig a trench around my altar, and now go bring water." saturate my cow, soak my altar, soak it, and they poured so much water that the trench filled around the altar, and he just stood back, and basically, and the Eric version of the Bible, he just says, all right, God, do your stuff. <laughs> then he prays, and a three, I think it's a three-year drought ends, and, you know, the Israelites rise up. That's the real God. They kill all 800 of the priests and prophets of the pagan gods and choose to worship God. And then he outruns a chariot. You know, I don't know about you. I go, man, if one of those things happened to me, I would never waver in my faith, ever. Man, I'd be like Superman for God. And that's what I'd like to think I'd be like, you know. But then Jezebel's like, Elijah, you're dead by noon tomorrow. And he goes in the desert and he just starts sulking for like 40 days. I'm just doomed. I'm dead. I might as well be killed. I might as well this. And finally God finds him in some cave and God's like, Elijah, what are you doing in there? Come on. Enough's enough. You've moped long enough. Let's go. Let's get out. I got work to do. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Let's go. And I, that's our God. It's like, okay. You screwed up. You messed up. Okay. Let's go. I got work to do. I don't have time to look back and mope. And, and I find that when I look back at the failures of my life and the mistakes, if I look back and they're surrounded in condemnation, shame, hang my head, hopelessness, that's the devil reminding me of them. But when I look back and I go, you know, right, that's an area I'm weak in. I do need to be careful in those areas. I do need to be on guard in those areas. That is something I'm not strong in. That's the Holy Spirit using that not to shame me, but to grow me, to remind me, and to bring to remembrance areas that I need to work. And so that's my heart that as we walk through this. Um, that anything that God may show you, any of the questions I ask, would be received with, ouch, that kind of hurt if it, there is anything. But I'm also excited because now I've seen something. Now I know what I can do about it. You know, I got it. Okay. And um, so last week, just really briefly, I showed you that picture. I don't know the actual name of it. I don't think it even has one, but I call it 10,000 Galaxies. And that one, um, 
And if you were able to watch the actual video from last Sunday that I posted, the things I couldn't show you, the enlargements of the different squares and the you know quadrants of that, they are on that video at the six minute mark. So you could go at least watch those. And then I talked to you about Beetlejuice. I know Denny and I got to see it after prayer night. It was beautiful. Did anyone, did anyone else see Beetlejuice this week? All right, Janice. Well, good job. Um, it's amazing. And when you remember just any of the facts I shared, you look up at that and just spend a few minutes being still, and knowing that's your God. Um, I know it wasn't the best week for stargazing, but you know it's it is pretty awesome. Um, and then I, I kind of close started to close out with, you know, to me this really awesome thing. That the Bible is so filled with stuff that I know man could have never created on his own. And, you know, just that the light, the heavens, declare the glory of God. And Jesus, the light of the world, declares the glory of God. And we are the light of the world, meant to declare the glory of God on earth. And just you start to see these, every, everything means something. You know, everything in the Bible has its physical meaning. And I feel like there's a spiritual picture of even something greater. It's like, I think it might have been C.S. Lewis, I forget, I said, we're living in the shadow lands. You know, everything that we see right now, one day, it's like, and we're going to see the spiritual truths and the heavenly realities. It's going to be like going from some black and white silent movie to this epic IMAX 3D multicolor, high density, high saturation. They just blow us away and it's just going to be incredible when we just see all this stuff that's just a shadow of, of much greater realities that we can't even comprehend. You know, I love what God talks about, you know, the Bible, eye has not seen, and ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. And I just, I love that, because what it says is as incredible as this earth is. You know, I remember the first time, well, the only time I ever really snorkeled much in Hawaii, and, and I was on top of the water, it was gray, and you know, the waves were... And I put my head in there, I was like, oh, I mean, the colors, the fish, I, I just like, I stepped into this, Spielberg couldn't have done it better, it was like this amazing, and, and yet with that, or you go and you hike up into the bamboo forest, or the waterfalls, or these places, God says, I have not seen, ear has not heard, there's nowhere on earth that he can even point to and say, you see that? It's kind of going to be like that. There's nothing we have even seen that he can even say it's going to be close. It's going to be so much more amazing what he has prepared in his spiritual realities. Um, and when I see these little things woven, the lights, the light, the lights, they declare the patterns in the Bible and the threads that run through the Bible I just only, not that I doubt this book in the least, but I just only become more entrenched in my assurance that this book was breathed out by God through the hands of men and that I could trust it from the first word to the last word of this book. There is no human way. I mean, I used to think it was bad in AP English and stuff and my English teachers would do all this, draw on all this symbolisms and this is and that. And I just start laughing and I go, you actually talk to Hemingway, my guess is nine of the ten things you say are symbolic in this book, he would have been like, no, they just were good in the story. You know, but, but in this book, the symbolism and the patterns and it just explodes. And and then the last thing that I shared last week is that, you know, often we want God's specific plans for our life. You know, what is your will for my life, God? What are your plans for my life? And God's already told us so many things that it's His will for our life. You know, He has told us so much about love your neighbor, forgive this, that, you know, and rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know, all these things, and I'll touch on more at the end, but I think of, you know, where it says in the Bible, he is faithful with little will be given much, and he is not faithful, even what he has will be taken away. 
And I think how often I'm asking God for his plans for my life, and I'm not even been faithful with what he's already told me. How can I honestly expect him to dump, you know, download to me when I'm not even shown faithful with what he's told all of us we're supposed to do? Just the basic common will of his life for our lives for his Christians, let alone the specifics for Eric. And I know I've got to work on that. There's so much. I remember Corey Tim Boone, you know, said, don't worry as you read this Bible about the things in here you don't understand, because there's definitely there plenty. Worry about what you do understand and you're not doing. And my guess is each of us could find a lot of the common will of God for his children that we all need to work on. And that are hindrances, that are blockages to the Holy Spirit moving freely in us, to us hearing God's voice. You know, I, I always struck by that verse in Peter, husbands, you know, love your wives and, and honor them as the weaker vessel, lest your prayers be hindered. You know, I mean, wow, guys, that's huge. Having a bad prayer life? Well, how do you treat your wife? Because right there it says, if you're not treating her as honoring her as a weaker vessel, don't come talking to me and expect to hear me very well. You know, don't let a root of bitterness creep up in your life. Well, who have you unfor not forgiven? What roots of bitterness? Don't quench, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, there's all these things. When, you know, we, we want, I believe, you are here because we want to honor God. We want to glorify God in our lives. We want people to see us and through us go, what an amazing and mighty God we have. You know, I think that would be our heart. Um, and we, we've seen, we, I, I touched briefly at the end last week, God is honored and glorified through our good works. And he's honored and glorified when we bear fruit. I'm going to bring those up just real quick again. John 15, 8. Jesus said, By this my Father is glorified, speaking to his followers, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. A disciple is not just a person who believes in Jesus. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. And then Matthew 15, uh, 5, 14 to 16 he also tells his followers, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So when we bear fruit, and fruit's not just works, that is fruit of the Spirit, Love, joy, you know, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, peace, these things. Through our attitudes, our hearts, our responses to circumstances, our responses when people wound us, um, these things glorify God. When his followers, their works, their good works, bring glory to God. See, these are not works for salvation. We have to get this right because someone doesn't listen carefully to what I'm talking about. They go, you're talking about works-based salvation. We've got to earn our... No, you cannot earn salvation. That is a gift of God given and you receive it only in faith. We could never earn it or afford it. It is the cost beyond all measure with the life of His Son. And if we believe anything is added to that, that we have to do faith in that plus anything... We have slapped God in the face. We have said there's something of more worth than your son's life. That is the pearl of greatest worth was the gift of Jesus on the cross. And by faith we receive that. No works. But he says, if you have received that and God has come to live in you, there will be fruit and works that come from that changed life. Okay, from the spirit and life of God in you and a heart surrendered to God. This is the difference and this is a key. If, if, you're, if you're sharing with someone and witnessing to someone or helping to disciple someone, this is, this is the distinction. They are not works for salvation or to be loved by God. They are works because you are saved and are loved by God and love God. They are works that come from being saved and loved by God. 
not to be saved or loved by God. God cannot love you any more than he did when before he even formed the earth and he knew every mistake you've ever made. He said, I will give you life, I will give you my son. There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for another, the Bible says. There is no greater love. He cannot love you more than how he's already loved you and loves you. So to understand that distinction. Um, so, but we know, and we've talked, we've looked at other verses, that, that good comes only from God. God alone is good. Ephesians tells us the fruit of good is found in, and light is found in anything good. God alone is the source of good. Our righteousness, apart from God's life in us, the Bible says is like filthy rags. We have no righteousness or good apart from what God does in us and through us. And therefore, if God alone is the source of good for us to produce good works and good fruit, the natural conclusion is that God has to be doing that work in us. It has to be His life lived in our surrendered life. Letting His life live through us. We have to be surrendered and say, here I am, Lord. Not me, but you. Not my life, but yours. You know, Paul would say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. And the life I live, I live by faith. Paul just laid it down. Here I am. Dwell within me and live your life through me. What's that you say, Holy Spirit? Okay, I'm going left. I'm going right. Okay. You know, what is it you have? Here I am. I'm your vessel. I'm your body. I'm your hands. I'm your feet. I'm your mouth. I am yours. May my life bring you glory. The assumption that... Um, we would have, then, is that God wants to live through us, that God has a life He desires to live through us. And I'm going to go ahead and skip those verses, Carol, and don't worry about bringing them up, But we've, because I've done this so many times in recent weeks, but just, just so you remember, God says that we are His workmanship in Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus for good works that He prepared in advance for us. And then in Philippians, it tells us it's God who works in us to will and to do His good pleasure. Boiling that down, whatever he's asked of you, whoever you are, the most exciting news, God has prepared in advance works for your life, plans for your life, each of you. Each of you. Ava and Chris included. He doesn't wait till you're 18. He has plans for you now. He wants to use you now for his glory. And he wants to live his life through you. And the thing is, we go, oh my God, what if, what if, it says he's already prepared them in advance. He's already gone ahead and prepared them. And he then puts his desire for them into you, that they become your desire. And then it says he works in you to bring them to pass. That's the most amazing news. This is incredible. I mean, what a privilege. guy named, last name of Wigglesworth, um, pretty wild name, but um, he was an amazing evangelist, healer, um, just I mean, controversial. He was so mad at the devil and so angry at the devil's work to feed someone had a stomach problem and everything else, and he'd punch him in the stomach because he was telling that thing, get out of them and everything else. But he's, he watched the dead rise. He had miracles, and it wasn't without pain. His wife died, I think he lost a child. It, it was not a ministry that was unchallenged, but it's with Wigglesworth. But he, he said, always be in tune with God, and then the music will come out as sweetly as possible. And I like that. I like that idea. If I'm in tune with God, if God's life is flowing in me unhindered, the music will come out as sweetly as possible. God has plans for us. And here's maybe one of those first questions we should ask ourselves. Is this exciting? Is this humbling? Is this awe-inspiring? Is this threatening? Does this make you feel like you're just some chess piece in God's cosmic chess game? Does it make you say, does he care about what I want? 
You know, where on that spectrum are you when I tell you God has plans for you that you alone can live out, that you are uniquely made for, that He's putting the desires for those plans in your heart, and He's working in you to bring them to pass, and He's already gone ahead of you to prepare the way. I have had all spectrums of responses to that, and at different times I have different responses. You know, if I'm in a place when I've had a lot of prayers that feel like they've not been answered, if I'm in a place my faith is shallow and weak, if I'm, this news isn't always the most exciting. If I have doubts that have been planted in me about his love, his goodness, his trustworthiness, his faithfulness, sometimes this news is threatening. You know, what about what I want? What about what I want to do? What if it cost me? What if it's threatening? What if it's hard? What if it's other times when I'm overwhelmed by His love, His goodness, His power, His majesty, to think that He has plans for me and wants to use a broken mess like me? That's exciting. That He's working in me and working ahead of me. That I don't have to do this alone. That I'm not carrying this. This is his church, not mine. This is his issue I'm counseling in someone's life, not mine. This is, you know, I remember one time I was driving and someone had been clean and sober off meth for quite some time and they'd fallen again and they were back and I was going to meet them and I just was overwhelmed. I was meeting them right here at the church and I just was like, Lord, I can't, I can't, God bless you, I can't do this, Lord, I, I can't. And he reminded me of something that a pastor had taught me years ago when Mary Ann and I started pastoring. And so Eric, and in that case, years ago, it was about a marriage. Someone was struggling in a marriage. And he said, Eric, that's not your problem. That's God's. You turn to God and say, God, you have a problem in that marriage. How do you want to use me? But yours to fix and he told me the same thing coming here. He was like, Eric, that addiction is not yours to fix, it's mine. All I need you to do is be my vessel. You open your mouth when I give you words. You love, you stand beside, but it's mine, not yours. Don't take this on. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And that is so free. And when I realized God has prepared his plans for me, God has, has, put the desires to do it in me. God works in me. Whatever you are facing, if you are walking God's plans, it is God's strength that owns that problem, not yours. You cannot change a person's heart. You can emotionally browbeat them. My guess is any of us could probably emotionally browbeat someone to the altar, guilt them and drive them to an altar. But it's not going to be a conversion until they have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. We are not God's attorneys. We are God's witnesses. And there is a difference. God wins the case. We just share what we know. We just testify of His goodness and His love. 2 Corinthians 3, 2-3. to three. Did I remember to put that in, Carolyn? I might have missed that. Oh, good. Paul... Paul's authority as an apostle and stuff was being undermined, he was being attacked, and he, he's writing to the Corinthians, the believers in Corinth, and he's, he's like, I don't need to defend myself, okay, you know, basically, we know who we are, and he tells these followers of Jesus that he was the instrument God used to convert them and to disciple, mature them, he said, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation, your life is my letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. He's saying your life is supposed to be known and read by others. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on the tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Other word, other translations I've read say you are in a living epistle. What are the epistles? The epistles are the letters here that you find after the Acts and up through with Revelations. They are the letters that have been written by men, inspired by God. And here it says that you and I 
follower of Christ are a living epistle. You are a living letter that God is writing upon hearts to be read by others as a testimony of God. Wow. This is exciting, people. Do you understand what this is saying? Okay, revelations hasn't happened yet. You are the living epistles from the last book of the Bible before revelations. You are the stuff being written that fills in between that and when he comes back as recorded in Revelation. You are the living epistles. You are what he is writing now. You are the ink. Your tab the tablet is your heart. And he is writing his story with your life for the world to read and to see him through. I would say God has a mighty plan and purpose and privilege for you, Christian. Jesus Christ himself, through his life called the Holy Spirit, is writing a story on your heart to be read by others. Please let that sink in. That is a privilege. But as you walk, you are a living letter for the people in your family, your life, your community, your workplace, your classroom, to read. And those words should declare Jesus as King, Lord, good, faithful, trustworthy, star breather, creator, forgiving, kind, compassionate, truthful, grace-filled, ferocious, righteous. They should be able to read in your life and mine those words through the testimony of our words, our choices, how we handle situations, how we respond to things, the priorities of our life, how we use our resources. You know, and again, don't let yourself off the hook easily. You need to ask these questions. Sometimes the hardest questions are the ones that change us the most if we let them shape us. You know, I've shared so many times when I told Dave Landon that time, oh, I'd love to learn, to, I really want to learn to play guitar. And he's like, you're willing to spend four or six hours a day? And I said, no. He said, you don't really want to learn, you just think it'd be neat. And I was like, you're right. That was hard to hear, but it made me honest. I've changed. I now say I think it'd be so neat to play a guitar, but it, I don't want it bad enough to pay the price. I, I've got other things that I need to do. You know, someone once said to me, you know, back when people still use checkbooks instead of Visa cards, but they said, don't tell me your priorities. Show me the checks you've written over the last month and I'll tell you your priorities. And I was like, ooh, wow. You know, what do I invest in? Me? Eternity. What are the priorities of my life? You know, though that was a hard thing to receive, but it did force me to go back and go, what do I invest in? My time, my money, my resources. But being honest and willing to get those answers is the first step, and then being willing to change. God will not force you to change. God values free will so much if he did not give us free will, he never would have had to die on a cross. If he had put us in the garden and just said it's all permissible, we'd still be living in paradise. But he said, you need to have free will if you're going to be in my image. And you need to choose to follow me above me. You know, we all cringe at the idea of these arranged marriages in the Middle East and feel so bad for these young ladies and getting sold off to, you know, 55-year-old men or 60-year-old men and all of this and that. And, but yet, that's exactly, if we hadn't been given free will, it would have just been, then we would have truly been robots. Even his plans for our life, he doesn't make us. He 
He says, should you desire, my heart is to co-labor with you. I love you. I want to live in relationship and partnership with you. I've made plans for you, but I'm not going to make you. Follow them. That's your choice. Everything in this garden is permissible. Except that one tree. Everything you need for joy, happiness, wisdom, intimacy with me, beautiful life is here. Everything. You do not need that tree. But I'm going to give you something that presents a choice. And you decide. You are living epistles of God. And he's still writing. Until the day he takes you home, he's just turning the next page and writing. And you are the paper, and he's the ink. And it is his hand guiding that. And times we can resist it. We've all got those Mars, the ink stains, and places where he slammed his hand and the pen went sideways and doesn't look so pretty and doesn't read so right. But he's always willing to turn to a new page and say, all right, should we pick up where we left off? And these are the questions. Bring up John 15, 1 to 11, please. This is the full context of the 15a we just read. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, the one who tends the vineyard. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. Why does he prune us? Why does it hurt sometimes? Because he wants us to bear fruit, to take part in the fruit of holiness, the peaceable fruits of righteousness. It talks about in Hebrews, he disciplines and corrects, not punishes, not pours out his wrath. That's been done on the cross with Jesus. He disciplines and corrects us that we might, when shaped by it, when we allow it to shape us, we might be partakers in his holiness and bear in the peaceable fruits of righteousness. He prunes us. Already you're clean. You've been forgiven because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me, remain in me, dwell in me, seek in me everything that is good and that you need. I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Next, please. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We can all do lots. We can run ourselves into the ground busy, but anything good, anything of eternal value, we cannot do it apart from God's life living through us. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Remember I talked last week, this isn't accidental. This is intentional. We have to choose to make God and His words and growing and maturity a priority in our life. It will not happen on its own. The busyness of life and the selfishness of our heart will crowd it out. Maturity is a conscious decision to pursue maturity and faith in Christ. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Next, please. And again, this is my, you know, those hard questions, okay? Oh, I really want to be a strong Christian. Really? Show me what you did in the last month. We'll give you your hour-by-hour -hour breakdown, and I'll tell you if that's what you really want or not. What did you do with your time? What did you do with your resources? You know, I really want to glorify God. I really want, do you? Let's take a look at how you spent your last week. You know, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Do, you. do you know how the love the Father is for Jesus, this perfect love? And he says, as the Father has loved me, so I love you, Christian. Abide in my love. Remain in that. Hold in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in His. 
these things I have spoken to you, not to beat you up over the head and fill you with condemnation and shame and guilt, but that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Jesus desires that your joy would be full. And how is your joy full? Only in an intimate, surrendered relationship with Him. It is the lie of the devil that you can find that happiness and meaning and joy apart from God and living in Him and His words and His ways. It cannot happen. And so I, I, I leave you with two thoughts that I will then return to next week. Um, actually three, very fast. How does a branch produce fruit? I guarantee those oak branches laying on my driveway are not going to produce any acorns next year. Why? Because they've broken off from the trunk, and the trunk was broken off from the roots. The branches never produced acorns on their own. It was the life of the tree flowing up through and out that produced the fruit. How do we produce fruit? When we abide in Christ, when we remain in Him, close with Him, soaking Him up, dwelling in Him, and seeking from Him everything that we need and everything that is good. It is then that we do not quench His Spirit. We do, we do the things He tells us to do. We obey His commandments. We forgive. We love. We surrender. It is then that His life flows through us and we produce much fruit. Second thing, we are at a crossroads in the teaching. Okay? We are at that point when we have to ask ourselves, do we choose our own path or we seek God's path for our life? This is a question you have to answer this week before we gather again next Sunday. Do I choose my own path or do I seek His will for my life, His path, His plans? Ask yourself that. And again, before you would say quickly, well, I always seek you know, His will and His path, Ask yourself, do I really? How many decisions do I make on my own? How many decisions do I really not ask? Or if I do, it's like, shoot that arrow prayer up and then go forward on my own. Kind of want to pull him behind my desires instead of my follow his desires. I know to ask these questions because they're the questions I must ask myself. And then the third thing, and it's one of those moments that you guys are going to all go, really, Eric? You just thought of this now. Okay, that's scary. You're our pastor. But um, one of those moments this week, it just kind of went, and I, I thought, I don't think Eve ever thought that eating that piece of fruit would sever her relationship with God. The devil neglected to tell her that small part. I think Eve truly believed she could have the best of both worlds. To follow her desires and to pursue wisdom and pleasure and stuff apart from God and still have a meaningful, intimate relationship with God. I, I truly do not believe it ever crossed her mind that eating that fruit would sever her relationship with God. I think she thought she could have both. And I think we do too. I think if we're honest, we often think we can follow our desires, our plans, do it our way, our flesh, and still have a close relationship with God, an intimate relationship with God, and we can't. We cannot have both. We must choose. The Bible says you are either led by the flesh or led by the Spirit. You may think you're in the steering wheel, behind the steering wheel, but you are not. You are being led by the flesh or led by the Spirit. And intrinsic, in the very definition of the word led, means you are following. You are either following the flesh or following the Spirit. There is no middle ground. Jesus said, you're for me or against me. With me, or opposed. You are led by the flesh or led by the Spirit in every moment of your life. And when we are led by the flesh, it severs our intimacy with God, not for eternity, 
But any hope of truly hearing the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, having fruit from the Spirit in our life is severed when we let the flesh lead us. And do not drop your guard. Most of the sin that has really separated a man from God was not done with bad intentions, was not those horrific, really bad things. Eating a piece of fruit, that wasn't the act, it was the heart. And we have to be careful, because we can walk away from God doing things in God's name. But Jesus simply says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I ask? So these questions are hard, but they are the necessary ones to put us in the exciting place. As Rich comes up, you know, I'll just say, you know, the stuff I've been sharing, the pain in my abdomen, the discomfort, the stuff, you know, you, you pray, you hope it's nothing serious, you... Do I want this? No. But what has happened from this is we went on a 10-day cleanse. I've lost weight. I feel so much healthier. I'm, you know, there's a lot of good that is coming, but I needed something bad to force me. How much better if I had just chosen to make some lifestyle changes without all this mess? Okay? But sometimes those hard things have to happen. Those hard questions have to be faced before we can change direction. Okay. So if you want to help Ellie, um, please let us, Carolyn or I know today, because we're going to send that check out probably tomorrow. Okay, so Father, thank you. Thank you for your love, your presence, your goodness. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit is there, is life in us to lead us into truth in your ways, and that there is no condemnation or shame from you. You saw it all before you gave us life. There's nothing we've done that caught you by surprise and nothing we have done wrong that you have not already nailed to the cross. It is finished, you said. It's over. All that is ahead for us is a life filled with promise and your plans through us if we just simply are honest with ourselves and receive that with joy. Thank you that your desire is that our joy would be full. And I ask that you would bless us, protect us in this coming week. Give us your divine appointments, your protection, your provision. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to pour out in us that we would have miracles in our life, in our bodies, our souls, our spirits, our emotions. And you would use us as conduits to pour out that power over the people in our lives, this community, our friends, our family, that they would see your power and your love and they would just glorify you and praise you and surrender to you. And I thank you. I thank you for this fellowship, this building, and, and the rain we had, and the rain that's coming. And thank you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.